Hi, I'm Ron James with the Center for Ethical Business Cultures in the Opus College of Business at the University of St. Thomas. We'd like to welcome you to yet another in a series of ethical insights where we like to explore topical ethical themes of today. Our guest today is Jeffrey Cookson. Welcome, Jeffrey. We're so glad with you. Thanks, Ron. Jeffrey is a manager of learning and development at Language and Culture Worldwide. And he was with us today to really speak with a group of business leaders about what are some of the challenges of taking values and using them worldwide. Are there different interpretations, different contexts? And how does a leader navigate that? And that's what we'd like to explore with you today. There were two or three themes we really worked on. Mm. One theme was what are some of the risks that organizations are facing as they try and take values that they've developed in the home country and take them to other parts of the world where they are now hosted by other countries? How do you make sure that you get clarity around what respect looks like? And how do you make sure that there's alignment of behavior and conduct that you want in the organization? That's what we'd like to explore for just a few minutes. But Jeffrey, maybe you can start by sharing with us what are some of the challenges organizations face as they try and do business around the world and think about differing perceptions of values. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, well, one of the things I think that is, that is important right, is the notion that one size isn't necessarily going to fit all. Yes. Right? yes. So the idea being that even though uh, a host organization might think they've done a lot of due diligence and the processes and procedures and systems that they have set up uh, work well, uh, there might need to be some variance in how those play out uh, in different cultural contexts, mm -hmm. right? So looking at really the, the notion of what is universal, right? so what is true for all people, mm -hmm. and then what is unique to a specific cultural context. So like you mentioned, there's respect, right? So the concept of respect is universal uh, um, around the globe. All cultures have a concept of respect. What's not universal is the specific concept of respect that might exist within a specific culture. So we can't just say uh, we want a respectful workplace without talking about in this cultural context, what does a respectful workplace look like or not look like? So really making sure we're looking at things not only through our own lens, right, and our own sense of um, uh, morals and values and ethics, but also looking at those things through the different cultural contexts uh, that we might have business operations in to make sure we're paying attention to how does transparency look like in mm. this cultural context compared to this cultural context. And so there might be a word that uh, can be used around the globe, but how it's interpreted in a specific culture varies. Absolutely. Uh, so Jeffrey, this notion of differing interpretations of a similar value or theme around the world is fascinating. Can you give us an example of how this might show up, please? Yeah, sure, thank you. So if you take uh, the concept of, of ethics and rule application, mm -hmm. right, the way in which we think rules should or should not be um, applied mm -hmm. to, to different contexts and settings changes around the world. And so there's a cultural dimension um, that's very well researched uh, by a researcher, uh, Gert Hofstetter, and that looks at how are rules applied. And on one end of this continuum, you have a universal context, mm -hmm. which suggests that uh, the rule should be evenly and equally applied to everyone mm -hmm. universally, regardless of uh, the situational context. Right? And on the other end of the continuum, you have particularist societies. And particularist societies perceive that the rule should be applied based on the particular circumstances and context that's going on. So things like the relationship that I have uh, with the individual who the rule needs to be applied to, their level in the hierarchy, uh, their history within the organization, uh, do our families have a connection or background or not, will often influence many people. And so what's very well researched is that some cultures lean towards that universal, apply the rule evenly to everyone, mm -hmm. and some cultures lean towards that particularist, uh, the rule should really get applied based on this, get the circumstances in this mm -hmm. situation or setting. So of course if we have a blanket policy that says always right, apply this rule this way, and we're trying to get a group of people Right, who think that there's always variance in how you should apply things, there needs to be some conversations uh, around that. So the rules might be applied differently uh, depending on where you are. 
Um, I'm, I'm curious as to how power starts to affect how the rules will be applied. Can you shed some light on that, please? Sure. Thank you. So there's another cultural dimension that directly applies to that. Again, very well researched uh, by um, a couple of different researchers actually looking into how power plays out. So the concept is power distance. And so a low power distance culture, um, the workplace is more egalitarian. And so power is more accessible. Mm -hmm. So people who are at lower levels of the hierarchy perceive that people who are at higher levels are accessible to them. Right? And uh, the same way uh, uh, from the higher levels. Right? They tend to have open door policies or want to be on a first name basis with people. In a high power distance culture, things aren't as egalitarian. Uh -huh. right? So there is much more rig rigidity in a hierarchy. Right? And so lower level people on the hierarchy perceive that there's no way that they are ever going to have access to the highest levels of power mm -hmm. right? and expect and accept that there will be differentials in access and levels of power. So that plays out in, in interactions in the workplace. So in a low power distance culture, a good boss says, hey, here's this rule, right? let's, let's pay attention to the ways in which this rule, what are your thoughts on how we make sure this rule gets played out? And of course, employees in that low power distance setting feel respected and valued yes. because their opinion has been asked. In a high power distance culture, if the leader came and said, hey folks, what do you think we should do with this? Those employees from that high power distance culture might be more likely to think this boss doesn't really know how to be a good boss because they're not telling us what to do. Uh -huh. So low power distance cultures, people will expect to be included in a process, their opinion asked, and they want to be able to voice their opinion. In a high power distance culture, the tendency is for people to assume that the people in authority are in authority for good reason and, and should just tell us what to do. Yes. And then we'll be good team players and just do what we're told, but, but don't have a sense that you should be asking my opinion. So that's an example of, of just mm -hmm. one way that, mm -hmm. that power can play out a, across a hierarchy. Sure. Gonna, uh, let's stay on this notion of uh, power for just a moment and use a concept um, of a value that particularly some cultures will focus on, and that's the notion of we value our people and we want to empower them to make uh, decisions at the local level. How might this concept of empowerment play out in a high power distance kind of culture? Well, that's a great question. Thank you. So the, in, a, in a low power distance culture, the, the idea of empowering individual employees to speak their mind, um, to, to suggest to senior leaders ideas on how to do things or things to avoid, this notion of interaction um, is much more likely to occur. In a high power distance culture, it might be perceived as uh, with some skepticism mm -hmm. or distrust for a leader from an, who's from another culture uh, that might be more low power distance to say to those folks from a high power distance mindset, oh really, I value your opinion, I want to hear what you have to say. But that might run counter to the, the, the cultural influences that people from that context have. So if I'm in that situation, I might think, I hear the leader asking me, but it, it's very uncomfortable for me to behave in a way that's completely counterintuitive to everything I've been taught my whole life as to what makes a good employee. Mm -hmm. So I'm at a little bit of a loss for what should I do here because I... I obviously have to come up with something to say, right. but I don't really trust that I should come up with something real important to say because that could, that could maybe put me in a bad light or put the leader in a bad light. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it creates a, a dilemma for that person to, to navigate through. Right? It also can result another way that that can play out in a, in a classic conference call setting is a, a low power distance leader saying to employees from a high power distance culture, I want to hear your opinions on that. Uh, and being met with silence, uh, right? Because mm -hmm. the, the concept is it's not our role, right, to give our opinion in this setting. So you're asking people to do something that runs counter to the, the value system that they, they've been brought up with, other messages that have been reinforced for what, it, what makes good behavior in an employee and a boss. And when we ask people to do that counter to what they've been taught, um, it can't happen in isolation. Yes. We have to have a lot of conversations around in this context this is what makes a good leader or not a good leader. And if you want to get this from a, a particular group, perhaps a different approach might be necessary for, from that particular group. Got it. Jeffrey, this has really been fascinating and very consistent with the conversation we had with, uh, with other leaders this morning. 
I guess a question for you would be, what key messages or what key lessons or insights would you leave with our audience about things they should think about as they're navigating different cultures and their values that are occurring, but they're interpreted different in other cultures? How does, how does one begin that journey? Sure. So I think it can be the same if we are navigating across national boundaries, uh, right? Uh, so for people operating globally, as well as um, as we look at domestic concerns yes. about diversity and different um, populations that might exist in a workplace um, that's, that's U.S. based. Some yes. of the very same lessons might apply, mm -hmm. right? Which would be for leaders to really have a good grounding uh, and be able to explain and articulate who they are culturally uh, along these cultural dimensions, uh, like power distance mm -hmm. uh, that we mentioned, for example. So can the leader, does the leader have a concept that there's variance across these things that are equally valid ways of doing things, right? and where do they exist on this continuum? Where might the culture they're from exist? Mm -hmm. Are they in sync with their culture or out of sync with their culture? The culture that they're interacting with, where does that exist on the continuum? Do the people they're interacting with, are they in sync or out of sync? So being able to learn about oneself and yes. articulate one's own cultural identity mm -hmm. right, is usually helpful before we try to learn about other other people's cultural identities and uh, practices and behaviors. Because of course, if I haven't learned who I am and how do my values surface behaviorally, if I haven't done that work and I can't yes. articulate that to people around me, it's very difficult to do a compare and contrast yes. to how do other people's values and behaviors surface. And, and sometimes it's recognizing that we might actually share a value, but behaviorally, the value might surface differently. So we both might value being a good employee, mm -hmm. and for you, being a good employee might surface behaviorally one way, and being a good employee might surface behaviorally differently for me because of our different cultural contexts. Yes. And being able to know where what one's starting point is so that one can do a compare and contrast uh, around other cultures. Got it. So it begins with self-awareness and then being sensitive to other cultures. But take us a little further and help us think about how that applies globally. Okay. Uh, so from a human capital lens, and it's, the term is often called glocalization, mm -hmm. right? So what will be globally, um, what will be universal across the globe and what will be localized? So for example, you could take a performance evaluation system and this notion of power distance. So what might be universal ac across the globe for the organization is that we will have a performance review process. Mm -hmm. But it might need to be localized so that that process plays out differently in different cultural contexts. So for example, the notion of a 360 degree evaluation of a senior leader might play well in a low power distance culture mm -hmm. where we feel power yes. is approachable. Mm -hmm. However, that very same 360 degree evaluation might not play as well um, in a cultural context that's a high power distance where the employees might feel it's not their role or responsibility and in fact is disrespectful mm. for me to give negative feedback about a boss that I might have because of the power differential. So it comes back to kind of acknowledging what is universal, right? We'll, we'll have um, a system right? and then what's not universal. In this specific cultural context, this is the adaptation Right, that, we, that we'll make for this system so that people operating in this cultural context can be just as successful as people operating in another cultural context. Well, Jeffrey, thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. Uh, we really value your insights. Our guest has been Jeffrey Cookson, Manager of Learning and Development for Language and Culture Worldwide. They're experts at really understanding cultures nationally but globally and how does one navigate those cultures to ensure you're getting the alignment you want in the organization? We want to thank you so much again for being with us. Uh, I'm Ron James with the Center for Ethical Business Cultures in the Opus College of Business at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, thank you for being with us in yet another in a series of ethical insights. We look forward to seeing you next time.